but I think we should probably start. So, many thanks for coming today, despite this terrible weather, right? Um, so this is an event that we run annually, and the idea is to give uh, students who are perhaps interested in the prospect of doing a PhD uh, a feeling about what doing a PhD involves, how you should go about applying for a PhD, what to expect when you start a PhD, how do you actually get a PhD, what do you have to do in order to, to get these two letters before your, uh, before your name. Right. Um, so we will talk about a few things. I will, I will start with a quick introduction to the thing that is a PhD. Um, I will say a few words about how it's different to a risk to a top degree. Um, your experience so far is all with, with top degrees. I will talk about what is different, what is, what is similar. Um, we will talk a little bit about career prospects. So what happens after you get a PhD? Do you have to stay in academia? Are there other ways? Uh, other other career uh, prospects, and we will talk a little bit about the stages of a PhD. So it's a, it's quite a long project. It's a three-year project. We don't just give you a topic and we expect you to come three years later with a uh, with the thesis. There are internal milestones, and we will talk a little bit about these. Uh, then Richard uh, will talk to you about uh, um, the research themes and groups in computer science will give you a feeling about what, what kind of topics um, people in the department are, are interested in. And then he will give you some, some advice on how to approach supervisors. So once you broadly know what, what area you're interested in, how to, to approach a supervisor, how, how to write a research proposal, and hopefully one that can attract some funding as well. And then uh, Paul Kearns has a, a few things to say about research training, about all the different ways in which we support our research students throughout these three years in terms of their training needs. And then, uh, hoping that they, they're not frozen to death somewhere out there, we have three people, so recent uh, graduates and current PhD candidates in the department who will kind of share their experiences about how a PhD in Europe uh, looks like. Right, so what is a PhD? A PhD is a three-year program. Um, it's research-focused. There are no compulsory top modules. Um, of course, as a PhD student, as a research student, you are welcome to, um, to, to, to join existing modules, to attend lectures, if you feel that they, they help you with your, uh, with your research, right? But you don't, have to, you don't have to take exams. They are not part of the of the degree. Um, it's an exercise where you develop a lot of in-depth knowledge on a particular topic. At the end of your PhD, at the end of a successful PhD, you should know more about your topic than your supervisor, right? And uh, although you don't have to, to take any modules, you can start contributing to teaching, right? So you switch over to the dark side you start becoming a teacher, right? You don't have to end up being an academic, being a professor, but as part of your PhD, you can start contributing to teaching as a postgraduate teaching uh, assistant. So you can be in labs, you can, you can be helping students, you can um, even give guest lectures on, uh, on topics in which you have, uh, you have expertise or an interest in. Right, so how is, uh, uh, how is a, a research degree such as a PhD different with the top degrees you, you have experienced so far? Um, so first of all, top degrees tend to cover multiple topics um, in, a, in a particular area. In a research degree, you will focus on a very specific, on a single, on a single topic. And while in top degrees, um, we, we give you problems for which we know the answers and we know how you can, you can come to these answers, this is not the case in a research degree. Um, no one knows the answer, um, and no one even knows if there is an answer or if you can come to an answer. We have, we have a feeling about it, but it's not always uh, correct. And um, of course, that's because no one else has solved that problem before you, right? So you are making a contribution to science, a contribution to the body of knowledge. You are kind of helping us as a species go a little bit, a little bit further. 
know something that we, we don't know so far. Um, and of course, this means that if, if you are having trouble with coming up with solutions for your problems, we cannot just give you the answer, right, because we don't know the answer, but we will work with you as peers uh, and try to, 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 find that, uh, try to find that answer. So why would you want to do a PhD, right? Um, I think the first reason is the most important one. You need to be naturally curious, right? You need to, um, to, to, to have this fondness of intellectual pursuits, right? Um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do career-wise, depending on the career you want to follow. So for example, if you wish to follow an academic career, it's a must, right? You need to have a PhD. Um, but if, even if you don't, if, you, if you'd like to, if you see yourself in, say, research and development in cutting-edge technologies, then a PhD can help uh, a lot, right? Because it's not only the knowledge you get on a specific topic, but also developing the scientific way of, of thinking, right? Of coming up with, with, uh, uh, with methods, of conducting research in, in a disciplined way, and of evaluating your results in a, an objective way, in an as objective as possible um, way. So, do you have to become an academic at the end of your PhD? The answer is no. Uh, it used to be the case that the number of PhD graduates and the number of faculty positions were very close, uh, maybe 30 years ago. Now you can see there's a much greater spread these days, which means that, according to this data, uh, only about one in eight uh, students, one in eight PhDs, ends up becoming uh, faculty. So what else can you do? It turns out lots of things. So this specialized uh, knowledge can be useful in, the, in a wide range of uh, in a wide wide range range of sectors. Uh, as things are becoming more and more specialized, having the skills, uh, having the in-depth knowledge de delivered through a PhD uh, is becoming increasingly important in uh, high-tech companies uh, like Facebook and, and Google, a disproportionate amount of the people working there in senior positions have a PhD uh, these, uh, these days. But it's not only the IT industry, it's uh, just it's across, across the board that this is, is becoming the case. So as I said, the PhD is a three-year project. Um, we, we don't just hand out a topic and then expect you to come back with an answer three years later. Uh, there are several internal milestones. Uh, in your first uh, nine months, you, would, you are mainly expected to review related literature, right? Um, see what's, what has already been done, find the gaps, uh, see what your, where your interests lie in, where you want to, where you want to focus. Um, progressively, you will be identifying interesting problems, right? So problems that have, have not been solved, problems that you have a natural curiosity to, to attempt to, to solve, and you will start thinking about how to approach these problems, or how to, how to go about researching them in a systematic way. Um, this is perhaps the most interesting part of your PhD, where you're deeply immersed into your research, you're actually solving, solving the problems you set out to, uh, in, in your first 12 to 18 months. And what's important is that, it, as this is scientific research, it's not enough to only propose solutions, just throw them out there, right? You need to evaluate them. You need to make sure that the algorithm or the system you're proposing or the methodology does better in some respect than what we already knew, right? and existing approaches and existing techniques and, and tools. And you need to, to do this in a very rigorous way, right? That is as um, close to interpretation as possible, right? Um, then comes the publication stage where you share your findings with the rest of the world. Uh, you write down your findings in papers. They undergo peer review. So you get other scientists to have a look at your work to evaluate whether uh, whether it's rigorous enough, whether it's correct, whether you have missed some, some important part of the literature. Uh, if not, if your research is deemed to be of, uh, of good quality, then it gets uh, accepted and it gets published. 
then at the end of coming closer to the end of these three years, uh, you have to write up your, your thesis uh, in computer science, at least in this department, the expectation is that you write the thing from start to end in a coherent document. Um, in other disciplines, it's enough to, uh, say, take three papers, put them together, write an introduction, make a conclusion, and submit this as a thesis. In computer science, you need to produce a document that kind of makes sense from, from start to, to end. And then comes the dreaded viva, right? So the moment where it's you, your thesis, and two examiners, one of which is an external examiner from a different university who you probably never talked to uh, before. Uh, and there you have to defend your work, you have, to, um, you have to show to your examiners that it's your own work, that you, you understand it and you can kind of support your findings. And I think that's pretty much it. So now I think it's Richard's turn to talk about how to come up with a PhD topic, how to get funding, and the rest. Okay. <clears throat> so you've decided to do a PhD. What do you worry about at the start of the process? There's several things. One is where to do it. Second, who to do it with, who should supervise you. Third is what to actually study. What's the project going to be? And fourth, how are you going to pay for it? Because you shouldn't be doing this for free. So I'm going to try to answer or address some of those points in the next 15 minutes or so. Starting with, uh, why might you want to do it here? Um, well, uh, you know York, and York is lovely, except for today when <laughs> we shouldn't look out of the window. Um, but um, in, in general, what you want to do where you want to do your, do your research is where there is a lot of activity, there, where it's uh, a lively research environment with people who are actively uh, pushing the boundaries of, of what is scientific and engineering research. So I've, I've worked at uh, three institutions, a gigantic research intensive institution, which is fantastic, but it was too big, I just didn't know what was going on. I worked at a non-research intensive institution where there were pockets of excellent work. Uh, and I've worked here, which is a small research intensive institution. And um, my personal biased view is that the small research intensive institution is the best place to do it. You get personal attention and you are really on the cutting edge of, uh, of everything. Um, so um, I've bigged up York a little bit. Let's big it up a bit more. Um, why study here in computer science? Uh, we do world class research. Uh, every five or so years, uh, the UK uh, academic sector goes insane and runs something called the Research Excellence Framework, where all research in all disciplines across uh, UK higher education is assessed using various metrics which are impossible to gain. Um, and last time this was run in 2014, uh, we did quite well. We were ranked seventh out of all computer science departments in the UK. There were about 120, 130 at the time. Um, so seventh overall. That of course, the ranking of seventh is made up of a number of different other factors, including uh, quality of our publications, um, the impact of our research, we rank fifth. This is, um, you know, how is our research actually used? Um, and in our case, it's used in industry. Um, so we produced a number of what were called case studies documenting how our research actually had an impact on society, which I think obviously did very well there. Uh, we ranked six for the environment in which we carry out our research. So part of that is the buildings, part of that is the excellent students that we get. That's a, a huge part of our research environment. So we have excellent students and we support them well in carrying out research. Um, we're, we're quite focused in many respects in our research. Um, it's, it, it focuses, uh, as you're probably aware, on a lot of systems engineering. That's underpinned by fundamental computer science. And as part of that, we cover both theory and applied research in computing generally. Uh, you know the department, but it's probably helpful to have a few summary statistics. Currently, we have about, depending on how you measure it, 35 full-time members of academic staff who are available to supervise PhD uh, research. We're currently recruiting up to 12 new members of academic staff who will be arriving over the next year to two years. So there's a lot of change. There's a lot of new people coming in. Um, it's, it's a very dynamic um, place to be, really. Um, and it, we already know that three of those new staff will be arriving uh, between now and next September. Um, the 
members of academic staff we have are all broadly in the area of systems evaluation methods. So how, we've got a system, how do we know it's actually a good one? Um, uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. <coughs> Uh, we have about 30 postdoctoral research associates. So these are people who have survived this process and are not so scarred that they uh, want to stop doing research. So they're, there's some number of years out of their PhD. Sometimes they've just finished their PhD um, and they're, they're now working on a research project. Sometimes they've been doing postdoctoral research for a number of years. So these are experienced researchers who are not faculty yet, but are also around to help guide research. We have about 160 PhD students. Uh, and across all the departments or groups that I'll mention in a moment. So that is a huge PhD cohort. We're one of the biggest in the UK. <clears throat> and we have a number of excellent technical staff to help uh, support the hardware and software research that we do. So how is this research coordinated? Um, well, times are changing. Um, the way that we, we structure our, our research has changed significantly in the last nine months or so. We coordinate our research around four research themes, and these research themes are really used to, uh, to help bring people together who are working on similar research, but also to um, allocate resources um, in, in terms of how we support the research. Um, we also have four research centers that I'll mention in a moment. The four themes are, are listed here. We have a theme on critical systems, and this, this is a theme that we've been very successful at over the last 30 years or so. This, is, uh, this wraps up Work research we do on safety, real-time systems, enterprise systems, software engineering, embedded systems, security, and autonomous systems, so self-driving cars, that sort of thing. There's a theme on health, well-being, and human-computer interaction that Paul here leads. Um, and, and this wraps up a number of pieces of work on, on healthcare, computing for healthcare, medical devices, uh, supporting, uh, supporting people in, in society, uh, and human-computer interaction. We have a theme on analytics, which wraps up research on data analytics, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, and related topics. And <clears throat> let's build better eyes beyond human vision. So we have a very successful computer vision group and who are looking now to actually push beyond the state of the art in facial recognition and image recognition and pattern recognition and create the next generation vision systems. Along with these research themes, we collaborate in or run a number of research centers which specialize in very focused areas of, of research for the most part. Um, <coughs> these are generally interdisciplinary centers that where the, the department either plays a key role in organizing it or collaborates with other departments or other faculties in the university. So one of the, uh, the largest of these is ICSA, the York Cross Disciplinary Center for Systems Analysis. This brings together researchers from computer science, electronic engineering, chemistry, physics, biology, management, uh, and mathematics, and, and other departments. Uh, they're based in the hub next door, uh, and you know, they work on a number of cross-disciplinary research projects, including things like bio-inspired computation. Digital Creativity Labs is also next door. This is a big center focusing on digital creativity, surprise, surprise, um, uh, in particular uh, games and gaming. Um, this is collaboration between computer science and uh, film theater television. The Quantum Hub is run out of physics. We have a number of researchers in computing, computer science who uh, specialize in quantum communication, quantum information processing, um, and, and they're based here. And the newest center we have, which um, uh, officially kicks off 1st of January, is the Lloyd's Register Foundation Center for Assured Autonomy, which is looking at assurance for autonomous vehicles of different kinds. So not just autonomous cars, but autonomous trucks, autonomous submarines, autonomous planes, et cetera, et cetera. How do we actually assure them and demonstrate that they are acceptably safe uh, and secure to deploy in civil environments? <clears throat> Underpinning all of these centers and research themes, we have our well-established research groups that you're probably aware of, given that you've, you've been in the department for a while. So uh, I'll just mention some of the, the topics that these groups specialize in. Uh, the Real-Time Systems Group particularly is interested in schedulability analysis, timing analysis, embedded systems, and multi-core. Uh, High-integrity systems looks at safety and verification, um, so we have specialists in um, making safety arguments that, that they, an autonomous vehicle is safe to deploy, um, and experts in formal verification, mathematical techniques for software engineering. 
Uh, the group that Dimitri and I are in is Enterprise Systems. We specialize in model-driven engineering, testing, cloud computing, and self-adaptive systems. Uh, artificial intelligence group does natural language processing, constraint solving, various forms of machine learning. And you know, the list goes on. We have a uh, computer games group, but I'll talk more about uh, games and Iggy in a moment. We have a, a nascent security group. Um, which is expert in things like cryptography, quantum cryptography, forensics, network security, and e-voting. Um, I mentioned computer vision and pattern recognition already. Paul is in the human computer interaction group who specializes in accessibility, usability, and immersion. And Advanced Architectures uh, collaborates in closely with computer vision. They build hardware to support things like pattern recognition, facial recognition, and specialize in neural networks and hardware design around that. So that sounds pretty exciting. There's a lot going on, a lot of groups, a lot of people doing exciting things. Um, and you, you'll see that there is, there's an emphasis on systems um, in, in a lot of what we do. Uh, so I think that, that's one of the most important things to think about in applying for commissions is the environment in which, uh, do, does the university provide the research environment in which you, uh, you'll be inspired? to do excellent research. <clears throat> so, next thing is, um, how do you find that supervisor? How do you find the right person to work with? Now, what we often say to, uh, to students is, oh, just go up and talk to us. We're friendly, but you know, it's kind of scary to do that sometimes, even though Paul, Dimitri, and I don't appear that scary. It's still well, kind of a bit weird. Um, so that process of talking to a supervisor is all part of applying for a PhD. Um, so, it's, it's the most important part of applying for a PhD, and the most important part, I think, of doing a PhD is finding somebody you're, um, you're compatible with, that you can talk to, that uh, you're not intimidated by, I think you can work with uh, effectively over a three to four year period. So, before you even go about making an application, find a prospective supervisor. That means one of us, works in an area that interests you, so that will help narrow it down a little bit. If you're not interested in artificial intelligence, you can rule all them out. But you're interested in HCI, you can focus on people in that group. Um, <clears throat> so somebody who works in the area that interests you, that you think you would be interested in working in, maybe because they published a paper that inspires you, or maybe that you can see in a sequence of papers that they've written recently, um, there, there's something in there that captures your interest. You think, oh, yeah, that person is on the same track as me. Um, I want to talk to them to see if, if there's something we can do together. But you may know about potential supervisors' research interests from a module that you've taken with them or from a seminar that you've heard them deliver. Uh, but there's also a useful list of activities, projects, and research interests here. And these slides will be made available. Um, and we all have web pages. Some of them are pretty lousy. Um, but most of them do list up-to-date research interests and linked up-to-date publications so you can get an idea of <coughs> uh, what we do. So when you talk to a prospective supervisor, and, and really we are not, not scary at all, and if somebody comes to us and says, I'm thinking about doing a PhD, uh, we'll probably buy you a coffee or something like that, so, um, or more stronger uh, liquid, and, and definitely want to talk to you. So, um, but don't go in unprepared. Um, when you talk to a prospective supervisor, think broadly about what you're interested in spending three years investigating. So if you're interested in software engineering, just for example, um, think about um, what aspects of software engineering interest you more than others, because it's a huge topic. Think about why you're interested in it. What is it about so software engineering that really motivates you? Um, is it because you've run into all sorts of problems in developing your own software that uh, you'd like to understand more about how to try to resolve? Um, is it because you think you can make a ton of money being a software engineering researcher? It won't happen, but um, it, that is a perfectly valid piece of motivation. Um, so be able to articulate why you're interested in this particular area when you, you sit down and have that coffee with us. Um, <clears throat> and think about, in very broad terms, um, what you would propose to do for a PhD. I'll, I'll say more about proposals in a second. Is there a challenge that you want to uh, investigate? Um, is there a question that you want to try to answer? Those questions might come out of a paper or a book that you've been reading, or 
some sort of um, technical problem that you've encountered in your own work. Like, I don't know, you've been working, uh, working with GitHub repositories, and you, uh, in your particular GitHub account, you have, uh, uh, I don't know, 2,000 different repos within your account, and you're finding it really difficult to manage that and understand which repositories are more useful than others for particular problems. You want to have a more effective way of actually querying and managing those repositories. So that's the sort of thing that, it, it, it may not be the topic that you study for your PhD, but it's that conversation icebreaker that will allow your supervisor to understand where you're coming from, what you're interested in, and what opportunities there might be to work together. So going into a conversation with a prospective supervisor cold is not a good idea, but having some general ideas about what these questions are, mean to you is really quite good. So <clears throat> when you write an application, um, you do all sorts of boring stuff like who you are, and academic um, <coughs> credentials, that sort of thing, um, transcripts, reference letters, that, that sort of stuff. Um, but one of the most important parts of the application is a research proposal. Whether you're applying to York or otherwise, a research proposal is expected. Um, the research proposal should identify some sort of question that you're interested in. I just made one up here. Not a necessarily interesting question, but I just made up something that looks like a research question that could be at the basis of a research proposal. Having some, give some indication of what the contributions might actually be. So if you want to try to answer this question, you'll need to deliver something that could be um, an experimental result. It could be a new piece of hardware. So, um, there was a research proposal I reviewed from this guy at Oxford who was building new technology to track badgers. Okay, that sounds bizarre. Um, but there is some really fundamental computer science in this project, of building hardware that you could put on a badger and it wouldn't run out of power uh, for about a month because these badgers are difficult to track. Um, and it's small enough to not actually disturb the, the badger. Okay, so some, some fundamental hardware design and software design because tracking these badgers underground is really hard. So, what might the contributions be? Is it a new method, a new tool, theory, proof, hardware, experimental results, some collection there about? And you know, this, is, this might be the, the least important part of it, but um, we, we always like to see it. Some idea of how you might go about building these contributions to try to answer this question. This is designed to help us um, understand how you think about solving problems. Do you, do you have an initial idea? It can be completely wrong. That's fine, but you have some initial ideas of how you might go about trying to solve this. So coming up with a skeleton for this before you talk, well, before you talk to your supervisor is a good idea because you can use it to have that conversation. You can then work on this with your prospective supervisor before you actually submit your application. So, so if you have that first cup of coffee with one of us, say, hey, this is sort of what I'm interested in. Um, we're going to work with you on refining this, improving it, and, and going through a collaborative process so that when you actually submit, you've got something that you're both happy with. Now, <clears throat> getting starting, started with this might look a bit difficult, but we've got some initial predefined projects on the web already that you can look at. And these are legitimate projects that we would be interested in supervising. So it would be fine for you to say, actually, that great project that, that Paul has proposed, I'd like to, to do that. Can I can we talk to you about that? Th that's, that's great. But if you have some idea of your own, that's fine as well. And you can develop it and make it look like one of these templates. So uh, talking to supervisors, as I've said, we're not scary too much. Um, we're very interested in bring, uh, bringing on new PhD students who are very motivated, excited about research, are interested in doing research. Um, one comment that I will make is that Different supervisors have different models of uh, the type of project they're willing to, uh, willing and able to supervise. Now, some of us are very flexible and open-minded about the topics that we can supervise uh, and the focus of those topics. So, um, I do a lot of work on model-driven engineering. That doesn't mean I only supervise model-driven engineering projects. Other people have a very rigid, fixed view on the type of PhD it is they want to supervise. And both of these are perfectly reasonable models. It's, it's what we're comfortable with. So you probably are not going to discover this without talking to prospective supervisors. Uh, and you have to decide what works for you. Do you want somebody who is you know, quite flexible about 
where the focus of the, the project will be. You want to have somebody who has a very fixed view on what it is that makes a successful PhD that they're willing to supervise. <coughs> okay, so that's about finding supervisors and developing that research proposal. Um, I think the last thing I want to talk about is money. Um, how do you pay for this? Well, the best way to pay for this is uh, to get studentships, scholarships, that sort of thing. And um, departments, including this one, have a number of studentships that um, are made available um, to applicants. We have a number of what are called the PTA studentships. Uh, these are training awards from our, one of our main funding councils, the EPSRC, uh, Engineering Physical and Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, these are studentships that are going to cover tuition fees and provide a stipend of about 15 to 16,000 pounds a year. Um, and we will have some number of these, we don't know exactly how many yet, probably around two or three. These are open to uh, UK and EU uh, students. There will be some number of department research studentship awards. So these are things that the department itself offers. Um, these will cover fees, but not a stipend. These are uh, open to anybody, um, and we'll have probably around three of them. We had about three last year. Um, there are more. The, so these are the main ones. Uh, you must apply um, as soon as possible. Applications need to be received by the 15th of January in order to be considered for any of these. So um, I'm saying you must apply this term. That means you must have worked with a prospective supervisor uh, to um, uh, work up a proposal. Well, I say must apply this term, I really mean before Christmas, because term, term is tomorrow. But um, you, you need over the next few weeks to work with a prospective supervisor to actually formulate a proposal and get your application into the system. <coughs> You'll make decisions on the applications for these awards by the 23rd of February. This is for a start of late September, early October next year. And all the details are on this URL here, which is linked from our um, department page. How are these decisions made? Uh, funding is decided on merit, so there needs to be a complete application with all supporting documents. There needs to be a coherent research proposal, so that needs to be worked up with a supervisor. That's very important. And there is an interview. The interview is with two members of staff normally, prospective supervisor and somebody else. Um, at the interview, you'll be asked questions about uh, your motivation for doing a PhD, your understanding of the research topic in the proposal, your background knowledge. So if you're applying to do a PhD in software engineering, but your background is in hardware, uh, do you have enough knowledge of software engineering to actually successfully complete the work? Um, and there are, there are a number of other criteria that are uh, um, considered during the assessment process. Um, we're particularly looking for research proposals that um, complement the department's strengths. So I mentioned a number of research themes and research groups. So if the, the project you're proposing fits in one of those, then it, um, it is a priority for us. Uh, obviously, we can't fund everything, but uh, things that complement what we do already uh, are, are important to us. However, games-related topics are not eligible for those studentships that I mentioned, and that's because there's a separate body of funding under the uh, Intelligent Games and Games Intelligence Doctoral Training Center that supports games-related research. Um, this URL has much more information about the Iggy uh, application process. They have separate deadlines. 31st of January is the deadline for applications at the moment. So I mentioned EPSRC DTAs and department funding. What other funding sources are available? Um, Iggy studentships, I've mentioned that. Uh, China Scholarship Council has scholarships for Chinese nationals where you need to apply through the university for that, so that's a competitive process too. And there may be industrial and project studentships. So Dimitri and I might have some studentships on one of the projects that we're, we're running. Um, I guess we have to figure that out at some point. Um, and there are other PhD studentships that will undoubtedly arise over the next few months as well. And these will appear on the department's scholarships pages uh, and advertise more widely when they become available. Um, caveat to all of this is, um, so, e if you're going to study for a PhD, you have to make some sort of financial guarantee to the university that you can afford to pay for your studies. This is, of course, much easier if you have a scholarship. 
Well, that just counts as the financial guarantee. There are additional sources of funding on universities, um, postgraduate research pages. Um, and if you are interested in following up on some of these, it's very important to talk to prospective supervisors as soon as possible because uh, you can't be considered to them until you have a, an offer from the department. Um, and that requires a supervisor to be lined up. And that's a, I think it's important to mention that scholarships can be created mm. as well, right? So we apply for research grants, we have money, how we spend that money, if we spend it on postdocs or on uh, PhD students, this can be quite flexible. So if you get a really good prospective PhD student who is interested in, in our work, then we can either create a scholarship from an existing pot of money, go talk to a company and convince them to, uh, to fund that studentship. So what's important to remember is you know, if you're interested, uh, if you have a, like a strong interest in something, go and talk to a supervisor, money can be found. Um. Yeah, I think um, I'll just close by saying we have other research degrees than the PhD. Uh, we have a, an MSc, which is a one-year uh, one-year research program. And we have an MPhil, which is two years, um, which are you know obviously shorter and not up to, to PhD level. Uh, and it is possible to transfer to and from a PhD um, if that is of interest to you. But I think I will stop there and hand over to Paul. Hi, so I'm, I'm Paul Kenz. I, I'm the research student's training officer for the department. Uh, I haven't been for very long, so it's kind of relatively new to me, but I have been training officer for the Iggy program, so I know a little bit about that as well. Um, I mean, in some sense, the PhD entirely is a training program, okay? Uh, it's an apprenticeship. It's one of the last apprenticeships that, this, that we still have in the UK, um, because what happens is we take you from a novice to a master at the feet of a master. In case of the idea of people like me to be just on the, on the masters, um, and that we've been through this process ourselves, and that legitimizes us as big as taking you through that process. Um, so we move from novice to ma master, master, and you do that by demonstrating your mastery. Okay, your, whatever it is in the research that you're doing, you demonstrate that you are able to master that research and reach the forefront of the field in whatever field that you've chosen. And in, in turn, to show that you are a master, you're assessed by other different masters, your examiners. Okay, um, uh, and that's, uh, these, are, these people will be, well, will be somebody from in the, within the department to, who acknowledges what mastery in this field looks like for our, from our perspective, but also somebody from outside of the department who is a usually international expert who leads in that area as well, and to assess whether or not you meet that criteria as being internationally masterful in your area of research. Okay, so in that sense, we are sort of bringing you through to be people like us. Okay. However, as, as Dimitri just pointed out, that's not only where, not the only place where people get employed these days with a PhD, and, and that those skills that you get in developing uh, and becoming a master in a, in a doctorate are valued in other domains as well. So that's the, the, the primary sort of training is obviously through the, through the supervision and the process of supervision that leads to you getting your doctorate. Um, but it does lead to you essentially having a, a unique selling point, your USP. Um, you end up with unique knowledge. Literally unique knowledge. Nobody else in the world will know what you know. Um, and in fact, you might be the first person in the world to know some of the things that you know. Um, hopefully not, not the last, because hopefully you'll go out and share it through your dissertation and through your, your publications. Um, and that's the whole point. But at what, some point, for a very brief time amount of time, you'll have unique knowledge. Um, and certainly you'll have a very specialised skill set that will allow you to obtain that unique knowledge. Because if, you had, if you're just doing the ordinary things the ordinary way that people have already done them, we'd know this stuff already. Okay? So you will end up with unique knowledge and a specialized skill set, um, but primarily also what you'll have demonstrated is persistence. Okay? A, a degree, a doctorate, uh, most people who start a doctorate are pretty much definitely smart enough to complete a doctorate. They have the, the intellectual clout. You've got a degree, you don't need any more sort of formal training. Um, what you've got to demonstrate is the persistence to keep banging your head against the brick wall of stuff you don't understand until the brick wall falls down. Okay? That is what you're doing with a doctorate. You are just Hitting it and hitting the wall until the wall gives up, right? At which point you learn something new, and you have a sore head. Um, so, um, so, so that's that's your USPs that you come out with uh, uh, from doing a doctorate. Um, however, um, so why then do you need a, a, a research training officer to give you, you know, to tell you how to do these unique things, which I obviously clearly don't know? 
uh, how to do um, because they don't exist yet. Um, well, the idea is that the, the purpose of training alongside a PhD is to kind of tell you to think about the sort of broader skills that you need in order to be successful. But certainly, to some extent, as an academic researcher, <coughs> and certainly as a, an academic in the more broad sense, as a, a member of higher education, um, but also that are just generally useful and that are valued in the other domains that you are also quite likely to end up in as well. Um, so these broader skills, I mean, they're the kind of obvious things, but things like presentation, time management, writing, if you don't have these, doing a doctorate is extremely difficult. Okay. However, um, also as part of doing a, a doctorate, you, know, you need to present your work in different formats, posters, talks, which are something like this, um, possibly even lectures, journal papers, increasingly other forms of media, so newspaper articles, conversation articles, uh, through social media, and so on. And these are all presentation skills which are essential for you know, really getting your work out there and, and also communicating what your research means. It's particularly important when you're being funded by somebody else who wants to look good as a result of your research. So whether that's the British government or some other uh, commercial organisation, being able to communicate your research and get it out there is essential. And of course, that's a skill which is essential in all sorts of walks of life, being able to communicate what you're doing, why you're doing it, and why other people should pay for it. Um, writing is a, another very specialised skill. Writing a dissertation is hard work. Writing a journal is a particular journal paper is a particular skill. But writing generally, once you've mastered that in a certain way, again, extremely valuable and useful skill throughout your life. And of course, as there, there if you like sort of broader skills that you can take out of your PhD. But in order to get that, there are some skills you need to have just to be able to, to do your PhD. So how to organise your references? Okay, what does it mean? You know, you might you've, you'll be doing a, a, a final year project, I'm sure. Um, you'll have some references to do that, but how are you organising them? And will that scale to the several hundred papers that you will read, um, but not necessarily reference, to do a PhD? Uh, and then there's some basic things as well. We need to make sure that you understand what we mean by research integrity, which is doing your research ethically or doing it well. Okay, so again, that's a, just a pragmatic stuff. It's important, it's sensible, but it's to get you the doctorate. Okay, but it leads to broader skills, which you then take away from the doctorate. So that's what we're trying to achieve with a sort of broader training alongside your, your supervision. How do you deliver that? Well, the university is aware of this, and it has the RET, which is the Research Excellence Training Team. Uh, I don't know, it's RET. It's some, I'm not sure this year they all, all, always remember either. Um, but they're very good. They have a huge range of courses that you can be able to select and go, th go uh, attend, covering some of the things that I've talked about, but perhaps covering things about how to look for a career with a doctorate and where to go on to, what to go on to do next. Um, one of the key ways in which we deliver the training within the department at the moment is the student-led seminars. These are uh, run by two, stu two uh, existing research students in the department. That's currently that's Betty and Sina. Uh, and what they do is try and get you organised to present the seminars that you want to have done. Okay? So that might be because you've got some specialist knowledge. I don't know. Somebody in this room might be an expert in Git. And so they could do a seminar on using Git to support uh, your doctorate. Okay, fantastic. Whereas uh, there may be that you want to think about getting a research proposal to fund your next stage of your career. And so we get somebody, uh, in the past we've had the, the, somebody like Richard Page come in and give a talk about developing a, a proposal for submission to a, a funding council. Okay. So these are led by the students, organised by the students, to be the, what you, the students, want to have. Um, and in that sense, I'm just here to make sure that happens and support that as well. Um, and then there's the York Doctoral Symposium, which I have a feeling Jonathan's going to talk a little bit about. Uh, a little bit, right, yeah. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> He'll never leave you now. He's going to follow you. Right. <laughs> that's, uh, <clears throat> that's essentially we organise our own conference. As far as there aren't very many departments that do this, we run our own conference in computer science every year by the PhD students, for the PhD students, but open to others. Uh, to disseminate their work in computer science and to give you the experience of being involved in a conference before you go out into the big wide world and do it in front of a, a, a full academic audience. So the training is delivered through these three, three main mechanisms, but there's also a kind of rather informal thing where you, you're learning together. Okay? You, you, you learn from the fact that you are in this very lively, exciting department that, that Richard was describing earlier, and we've got research groups. So you should be expecting to learn from your research group. You should be meeting up with the people in your research group or who are doing similar work, um, and, and trying to understand and work together with them. You, have, you will have unique knowledge and a specialised skill set, and often that leaves you in a position where you're just kind of on your own doing your thing, because there's nobody else who can do your thing, and nobody else can tell you how to do your thing better. 
because that's the nature of doing this sort of advanced specialized sort of research. Um, and so these, this sort of the research group becomes very important just as like a sort of support network around you, but help encourage that. We also have informal lunches. We try and do uh, a couple of those a year. Um, just an opportunity for people to get together. We're currently talking about the Christmas lunch on the emails. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think Christmas will be in January this year, but it's, it's, uh, uh, that's just for pragmatic reasons, um, just as we get ourselves organized. Uh, and also we have a lot of cake. There seems to be a lot of cake around research student training. Uh, so the research student seminars, uh, yeah, they, they finish with cake, is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, and when we have other events and things, there's usually a lot of cake around. And so these are opportunities for you to basically get together and again meet up people who you kind of know but you know, don't, don't have otherwise a reason to meet because they're not doing exactly the same research as you. But nonetheless, they're important ways of making connections, learning from each other and supporting each other. So there's formal training and then there's the, the informal stuff that comes from being in a lively department like this. Any questions at this stage? Okay, but anyway, um, I'm Jonathan Rayner. Um, I am a PhD student now in my second year, um, so I guess I'm kind of talking about the kind of view from the trenches, if you will. Um, <laughs> um, not that it's a war, it isn't, but, you know, that's an expression. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is um, kind of why I decided to do a PhD, what kind of brought me to this place. Um, what is my research currently about? Because it changes week to week. Um, that's the nature of research. And um, <laughs> successes and challenges and kind of should you do a PhD? Because I guess in some sense that's why you've turned up here. Um, so I guess I should kind of answer your questions in some respect or other. So um, looking at kind of why I decided to, to do a PhD, this question has dogged me for my entire life. I have people constantly asking me, even to this very day, last Christmas actually, my, my grandma turned and said, so Jonathan, when you grow up, what do you want to do with your life? I was like, thank you, grandma, for thinking that my, <laughs> my life is worth living. Um, but... Um, but up until the age of 16, I had a very easily formed answer in my head. Whenever anyone asked me this question, I would answer them. And I would say, I wanted to be a Power Ranger. Specifically the red one, because all the others are just bad. Um, <laughs> but no, you know, but being serious, I had, um, I had this answer as a joke because I really didn't know the answer. And I had no idea kind of what I wanted to do. And so I kind of thought, well, how do I, sort of how do I you know, find out? How do I even, you know, I have no idea what career I want. How do I find out? And so I thought, well... I'll try different places. I'll go to different employers who happen. So I started off and did some work experience with these guys, which is a place called Provident Personal Credit. You may have heard of them. They're, this is being recorded, so I can't say what I really want to say. But they're, um, they're not an amazing company to work for, put it that way. Um, and I worked there, and I really didn't like it. I hated working in an office. I hated the corporate environment. I really didn't enjoy it. But I kind of thought, this is a voyage of discovery. This isn't a chance to just be turned off from work entirely. I should move on and try and find kind of different ways to express kind of what I want out of a job. So I went to BlackBerry in 2013, and I did a placement year with them. And I worked on their core performance team. So what we used to do was they would strap all these phones to the inside of vans and drive them around major cities, and we'd get these million cell spreadsheets back every week and have to try and make some sense out of them, um, which was fun. But um, we, So what we did there was a lot of automati automation of analysis. But again, I had this issue with kind of everything there was very, very corporate. So everything that you did was... How have you generated value for the company in the last minute, 30 seconds, one second? And it was, I couldn't deal with it because there was no chance for kind of personal development. There was very little sense of looking at you as a holistic person. It was all very much kind of um, this kind of corporate giant and how much good you were doing for the company. And then I went to ETAS in 2014 and it was a completely different experience because I got involved in this research project where basically my boss came on to me one day and said, we've had this project on the shelf for about a year. Um, do you want to have a go at it? And I was like, yeah, all right, fine. And he left me alone for a month because he was busy with other things and then came back and he was like, what have you done? And he looked at it and he was like, wow, no one, no, no, no. we didn't think you'd get this far. And I was like, okay, fine. And I really enjoyed it because it was a chance to kind of just be, just kind of go at a problem and just kind of try and solve it. I had loads of resources, I had loads of support, but it was a problem that I had to solve and no one had told me anything about how to solve it. And that was just really exciting. And I kind of, when I came back, this was just before my final year. So when I came back, in 2015, I kind of thought, maybe research is kind of where I want to be, and a PhD was kind of the route into that. At the same time, does anyone know who this is? Was, was it? Was it? Yes, it is. Well done. I'm glad somebody knows. It's good. The message is getting through. Randy Pausch was a computer science lecturer back uh, in, an in, he died in 2009 of liver cancer, but before he died, he gave what was known as the last le his last lecture. And in that, he talks about three things. He talks about how his childhood dreams and how he achieved them how you, as a person watching, can achieve your childhood dreams, and also how to enable other people's dreams. And he gets into this third section, and he talks about that, and he says, 
you know, being a professor and being involved in so many people's lives, I saw that so many times, and I was unable to do that for lots of different people. And when I watched that and I heard it, it kind of all clicked into my mind, and I was like, okay, professorship, education, that's where I want to be. And combining that with the research thing that I really liked, I kind of thought, okay, PhD kind of encompasses those and leads me to there. So that's kind of where I want to be. And that was my motivation for doing a lot of the research I did or wanted to do. So what's my research about this week? Um, this week, I'm looking at, no. Um, so this is, a, um, this is a processor, sort of in schematic form. And what my research is currently looking at is that at the moment, when we design processors, we design them and we basically put them inside a black box. So you have a processor and, you know, you get an instruction manual with it. You supply it some instructions. It does some things. But we don't really know how it does a lot of that. A lot of it is protected by proprietary licenses and controls and that kind of thing. So when something goes wrong, and I'm not talking about kind of simple program errors, but if something, say, takes too long to execute, it's very, very hard to work out why that is. Because you can't look inside a processor in a kind of physical way. So a lot of my research is looking at how we can take a lot of the information that's inside these, process these processors and make it visible to people when we're debugging or when we're trying to make code fit with particular performance criteria. And it's helped by these two organizations. RISC-V is an ISA, an instruction set architecture, which is competing with things like x86 and AMD's um, ISA and that kind of thing. And Porpino is um, a, an instance of a RISC-V architecture. And what I'm doing is taking, Porpino has all of their source code at the hardware available online. So I take a lot of the Porpino source code and change it and try and add in new data paths and other things to try and make the data that it's generating about how the data in the process is working more visible to people. And we're, we're getting good results so far. The end result is eventually to be able to produce these what are called time traces so that we can see for things like predicting worst case execution time, as you might have seen in some modules, we can make that a lot easier if we can do a lot more sort of accurate measurements without perturbing what's going on. And that's essentially where a lot of my research is kind of focused. So successes and challenges of this kind of this PhD. So this kind of idea of where no man has gone before is something that I find really interesting because when you're looking at a lot of research papers, you kind of look at them and you see all these sort of patterns start to emerge as you read lots of them. And the idea, when, if, when I was looking at them and I found this gap, this niche, this thing I could fill, it, that was the most exciting thing. And that's one of the things I think you become better at as you do a PhD. But it's one of the things that most excites me is to think that there is a gap in research, a gap in knowledge, and I can contribute to it. Not anyone else, but just, you know, it's something I, only I can do. And this is a picture from YDS, as Paul was just saying. This is me and my, the committee that put on YDS. Uh, some of these guys are from electronics, but um, CS as well, because it's a joint thing. Um, but one of the great successes that I think, that I think I've had, I guess, is trying to plug into lots of the other opportunities that Paul was talking about. There's not only the training opportunities, but also lots of public engagement opportunities, and Funding bodies are getting more and more excited about the potential for public engagement stuff. So things like Pint of Science that you might have seen, um, uh, Three Minute Thesis is another one, and there's lots of other kind of opportunities to not just to kind of make you a better researcher, but to get your research out to other people. And that's something that um, I'm really interested in and also something that I feel I'm kind of getting better at. One of the challenges, um, particularly is with regards to how much freedom you have in a PhD. Um, as this SKCD cartoon uh, free kind of demonstrates the effect of what freedom might have. Um, you know, in an, in an undergraduate degree or in a postgraduate taught degree, you have an awful lot of freedom. Oh, sorry, rather, you have an awful lot of structure. So, you know, you have a set of fixed deadlines, you have a set of fixed modules that you turn up to, and that kind of thing. In a PhD, that all just kind of disappears. You have regular supervisory meetings, but there's kind of very little structure there. And so you have to learn the kind of things that Paul was talking about in terms of time management and prioritization. And that sort of thing. And for me, that was quite hard at the start. Even just like, kind of learning like when my when my kind of up times and down times were. Like because I worked much better in the morning than in the evening, so I restructured my days around that. And even just learning things like that was quite kind of illuminating. But it was quite a challenge. In the first couple of months, I just felt I wasn't getting anything done at all. Um, but that kind of got better as time went on, and I was able to access more of the kind of resources that were available to me. So. Should you do a PhD? There are kind of really four questions that I think you really need to ask yourself if you want to do a PhD. Do you have the passion to solve a really specific problem? Is there some problem in research that really kind of gets you going and you really want to talk about it the whole time? Or are you able to find one if you don't have one already? And do you have a drive to work on a problem where there might not actually be an answer? Because that's one of the things in a PhD. Sometimes you can do things for months and then realize that the thing you're trying to do is impossible, which is sad, but at least you've learned that it's impossible rather than doing it again. Um, but, you know, but when you're an undergrad, you can just go to your lecturer and say, I don't know what the answer to this is. But 
you know, but sometimes there isn't an answer and you just kind of have to keep banging your head against the wall until it falls down, as Paul was saying. And do you have the commitment to dedicate yourself to, to just one thing for a long period of time? You know, some of us are kind of quite ephemeral and we like to kind of jump around and work on different things. And others of us are like, no, I like to do this one thing till it's done. And you can be ephemeral in a PhD in a sense. You can jump around and do lots of different things. But you do have to remember that you do have a, a thesis to write at some point and you have to sit down and really commit to that. So, you know, there's definitely that kind of aspect to it. And also this kind of last one is something about do you have or want, are you willing to learn to have the ability to be self-reflective? Because one of the things I've learned most in doing my PhD is I can do a lot of things, but if I don't sit down and think about what I did and how it went, I haven't learned anything from the process. And really, doing a PhD is coming into some sort of sense of academic maturity in some sense. And to do that, you really need to become self-reflective so that you're responsible for your own learning and for how you're going as opposed to anything else. But if you can answer yes to all those questions and you really want to do a PhD, then I think you'll, it's definitely something you should consider at the very least. So that's kind of me and a few kind of reflections and ideas. There's my contact details. I sadly can't stick around for the Q&A after this because I have to go off and teach. But um, thank you guys for listening, and I hope that um, that kind of helped you out a little bit. Well, if you want to do a PhD, one of the first things you need to think about is whether you have patience enough to deal with slow machines, which is something that happens as well. Uh, I do not. I'm not that sure that you need to have all the things that were just mentioned. I mean, well, I do have a passion for the topic I work in, but I. I am not sure, even though I am 42 years old, I was mature enough to know all these things at the beginning. So doing a PhD is also a way of learning those things. So if you don't have all the answers for the key questions you just saw, don't feel like, you know, I cannot do it. You will have a lot of support in York. Uh, well, if the screen is not working, I can just go through my notes. Uh, it's, it's going really slow. So. Uh, I thought about uh, this in terms of a uh, simple interview, uh, because I'm just a normal guy, like everyone else. So, so well, if someone is smart, he invites me to talk about uh, what is it to like, what is it like to, to do a PhD at York. My answer is going to be quite personal. Uh, I'm a student from Chile. I come from South America. English is not my first language, so doing a PhD was a huge challenge for me. Uh, now, I had the advantage that I did my master's first year at York. And um, while doing my master's, I fell in love with the university. The university is great. It has uh, lots of things that uh, make studying here a lot easier. Uh, one of those obvious things is a friendly atmosphere. So wherever you go, whether you're dealing with uh, support staff or you're dealing with professional staff or with academic staff, everybody's friendly and they will be willing to help you with your studies. Um, they have, of course, great facilities. And I'm not just talking about the computer science department. I particularly uh, like the fact that we have a really nice library and that's open 24 hours a day, every day of the year. So every time I had to have a meeting and discuss my projects or my ideas with uh, colleagues or friends, we could always book a room in the library and work there, discuss our ideas, work with a, you know, a whiteboard, and there was always space for doing that. Now, as speech they do it. You have your own space in an office, so you also have great facilities for you as a researcher, as an individual researcher. I also, of course, like the quality of lecturers and researchers at York. Um, so, and, and that was definitely one of the reasons why I came here in the first place. Uh, when I came here in 2013, I had a uh, very long experience uh, being a psychologist for 20 years. Uh, and I've been working in projects involving technology for a long time. But I, I was always this strange guy in the room. Like, why is this guy involved in technology projects when he is a psychologist? Now, here I found uh, one of the oldest uh, research groups in the UK in human cognitive interaction. Um, and the head of the group is a psychologist. So, uh, when I had the first lecture, I remember doing my master's with Helen, I immediately looked at her eyes, we were talking the same language. Um, and I realized that the answers I came to look for, because at that time when I uh, came to York, I was working for the Chilean government as a head of research in a digital government. There were a number of things we did not know, things that are not written in any book, uh, things that no expert will tell you, you know, this is the answer, this is the way you improve the government, this is the way you make life for citizens easier, just doing this thing. Uh, this is the way to measure it, this is the right instrument to evaluate things. So, so since those answers were not there, but here we have the people with the knowledge on how to research those questions, how to create instruments 
to measure those things. How to validate the things you are looking for. Uh, I thought, well, dogs is exactly the right place for doing this. They have the experience, they have the knowledge, they have the skills, and they provide the team with a lot of support. So definitely, uh, dog was the right place. And of course, dog is also a beautiful thing as well. So if you come to study here, it's going to be a great opportunity for you. I am a mature student, I live with my wife, and we have spent a beautiful time uh, during the last four years in York. Um, and and you, if you've been here already, you, you know that. Um, what particular aspects of the university I like? Uh, well, I like many things about the university, but particularly I like the feeling, the, the, this atmosphere of freedom of expression, the, the idea that you can talk to people from different departments. I did my master's in sociology and computer science at the same time. And I had a chance to interact with uh, lecturers, researchers, research students from different departments. And, and the openness is, is a really important thing uh, for me, at least. The idea that I can uh, bring a question that comes from, I don't know, um, an expert in, in, in linguistics and uh, go and talk to my supervisor and say, you know what, this person, uh, you know, Bryce, he had these ideas about how uh, communication could be more effective, uh, but I don't know how does that particular thing deals with how we communicate things to people in e-government. Do you think that will make sense, like linguistics and human interaction and e-government? And then my supervisor would always listen to me with a very good ear and say, okay, why don't we think about it? Why don't we discuss this? Why don't you come and do some, you know, literal review, go through these ideas and we can think whether this material is useful. So there's no restrictions in terms of how free you can be to think about your projects, to think about your ideas, how can you explore, explore your own topics in the way you want. And I really like that sense of freedom. Uh, the other thing I like is that the university itself offers you a lot of support. And in many ways, I'm not just talking about academic support. In terms of academic support, you have for international students like me, uh, the CELT, so if English is not your first language and you want to improve your English skills, or even if you're a native speaker of English but you're not prepared for public speaking and you want to pursue a career in academia and you want to be in front of people talking or you know, improvising because your computer is not working, then the CELT can provide you with that kind of help and support. Uh, there are free courses for PhD students, so if you're going to take PhD at York, you can take advantage of those courses as well. Um, I like that uh, the university also offers you support with all the specific skills that you might need help with. So for instance, there's a writing center. So yeah, I like, I like and I, uh, writing a lot, but necessarily academic writing is a little bit difficult. So if you need help with that kind of thing, the university has a writing center where you can go and they will provide you with help uh, with your writing. If you write a paper for a conference, if you're just writing a chapter of your thesis, they will help you with those things as well. Uh, I remember one time uh, I had issues analyzing some of my data. Kevin, my supervisor, wasn't here. So I went to a math skills center. I had a chat with uh, a professional that was working at math skills center, went through my data, and he helped me analyze it as well. So you also have those kind of support that can be really helpful when you're stuck with the problem. You're never alone here. Um, I like as well that uh, since I wanted to pursue a career in academia, the university offers me with very special opportunities. So you have a number of uh, courses that uh, the red team will offer you. So the red team is the research excellence uh, training team that will help you with uh, developing your skills for working as a researcher or as an academic. So in my case, since I started my PhD, I started taking all the certain short courses that I uh, like two hours or three hours, but they will explore specific things that you see every day when you're working teaching or, or in research. So they will help you plan, you know, applications for grants, or they will help you with, you know, learning skills to assign a session to uh, work with students, or how do you deal with international students, what are their specific needs, and how can you support the learning. Uh, but beyond that, beyond the, the, this uh, wide offer of short courses that you have, the university also offers you a specific program that's called the Job Learning and Teaching Award, the, world, the YLTA. Uh, I took the YLTA, oh, I hate now, uh, So I took the YLTA, you can see all my files, it's really nice. Um, 
So uh, I took the YLTA, and the YLTA was excellent. Uh, the YLTA is a nine-month intensive program, free of charge. Free. Don't, don't, don't take the YLTA in your first year. Have some experience first. On the second year, third year, feel free to take it. Uh, the YLTA will uh, involve you taking part in a number of meetings with people from all different departments of yours, all of whom want to become academics in the future. And you will be discussing how to design a session, how to uh, evaluate students, how to reflect on your own academic practice. And it's not just that you need people to talk about how is it like to be teaching students, uh, how is it to be designing you know, evaluation methods. No, it's an, it's an accredited course that will give you a certification. So if you want to become an academic later, you can use that accreditation to say, I'm a, I'm a uh, fellow member of the Higher Education Academy in the UK, which gives you an advantage. Uh, the number of people who have taken the YLTA and now have positions at different universities uh, because it was something most universities don't have. So the YLTA is a really good opportunity for you. There's also personal support. I will not go into detail with this. But we have student support hub, uh, the nightline uh, service, the open door team. So if you're feeling alone, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling depressed, if you're asking yourself the good, the key questions that were on the screen when I started my uh, talk, uh, there are people available at the university who will be able to listen to you and, and deal with your questions. Um, and in particular, uh, being a uh, a student at the computer science department has been great for a number of things. I think the two two main things I like. One is the academic opportunities you have, um, and the other one is the social opportunities you have. In, in terms of academic opportunities, uh, I like that you have that meetings regularly where with your uh, supervisor and a person who's your assessor. So my supervisor is Kevin Petrie, my assessor is Paul Kent. Uh, so when you present your work, your assessor will come back with a lot of comments about how can you improve your work a lot? So, uh, and your supervisor will be guiding you through your research. Uh, the number of seminars, I think Paul already mentioned this, so there's a research group seminar, the HCI seminar that runs every week, there's also a departmental seminar. Uh, so you have lots of opportunities to learn about what the department does and, and how can you uh, use techniques or methods that you see in seminars in your own practice. Um, you also have the opportunity to present your own work. I like that if you are in York and, and you want to uh, progress in your career, you can also take part in some specific research networks. In my case, I am a member of uh, 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 STS network, so the Science Technology and Society Network, and I work with lecturers uh, from different departments and member of a professional network, and we have contacts with other universities as well. So this is Anything you want to do at your as an academic, you have the opportunity to explore that and, and develop your skills in that area. I already mentioned the uh, working as PTA, so you have lots of opportunities for teaching here, uh, and you will be involved in many different aspects of teaching, from designing session, uh, delivering session, demonstrating in a lab. Uh, there are many, many opportunities. I like that the, the job also provided me with the opportunity to present my work at conferences. So I'm not just saying that, yeah, I wrote a paper and I said, submitted to a conference, but my supervisor will be there to check the paper with me, to check my poster. If I was presenting a poster, uh, I would have an opportunity to discuss what I'm going to say, how will I, I will address questions, if people are asking questions, and those kind of things. Um, I have also the, the chance to review papers uh, for academic conferences, so becoming a, uh, you know, a member of the research community officially. And, um, and I also help organizing conferences. I was a member of the organizing committee of the Universal Design Conference, which is the international conference we organized in 2016, and we'll have you know, researchers from different parts of the world coming to uh, our university to take part in this uh, conference. Uh, and I also like the social opportunities that York offers you. So in my case, uh, I really like the fact that uh, despite being probably the only person from Chile, I'm probably the only South American guy as a PhD student. I don't know if there are any others. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, but we will have people speaking Spanish. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I met lots of friends from different cultures and nationalities, and it has been great. Uh, in particular, one of the ways in which I enjoy meeting people at York is through society. So 
Jordan has a number of literary societies uh, run by Jusu. Uh, when I came to Jordan since I'm a golf player, so I like playing uh, board games, and particularly I like to play golf. Uh, I realized uh, Jordan didn't have a golf society, so I just set up one. Uh, I used to provide me with all the help I needed to set up a society. I invited a couple of friends, and then for three years and a half, we've been running a golf society in Europe. And we have members of the community, and we also have students, even members of the staff sometimes come and play with us. So that's really great as well. Um, I like, uh, well, the fact that we have a number of social events in the department as well, followed by the mention of cake. There's nothing else to say about it. The cake is always there. And I like the fact that uh, I've also been given the opportunity to, despite being a non-native speaker of English, being a guy from South America, so the other side of the world, I'm a two student, so 43 years old, and I'm a PhD student. So I have the opportunity to represent other research students. So I really feel this sense of inclusivity and acceptance of diversity in the department and the university as a whole. So uh, I hope I describe through these three key questions of why did I choose to come here, why do I like uh, being a student at Jordan, and why do I like this particular department. So I hope through the answers I gave to these questions, you learn a little bit more about what it's like to do a PhD at Jordan. If you have any questions, I don't know if we have time, but we have to answer questions. Probably later. Okay? Thank you very so much, we Leo. We do, have, uh, we do have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so. Do you have any, any questions? Does anything come to mind? No. That you would like to know? Yes. Are there specific academic requirements? Like, you need like two one or like yes, you need to have a master's? Uh, typically, you need to have a two one. You don't need a master's. Uh, but that can be uh, kind of uh, offset by having specific knowledge and uh, experience and work experience. Uh, so we can accept those students with the two two as long as they have a demonstration in the area and some experience, so that we're confident that they will actually manage to um, you know, do a good PhD. Okay. So this is the, the main reason why there's the two one that is required. But it's not a hard requirement. We can, you know, we can assess things on an uh, individual basis. Any other questions? The important thing to keep in mind, uh, if you are thinking of a PhD, if you would like to explore this possibility, um, talk to supervisors. If you're not sure which supervisor you would want to talk to, send me an email, right? I'm Dimitris Kolobov, so you can search, we can, we can search maybe on, on Google. Um, and because, as I said, opportunities can be created. Right. So, for example, Richard and I have a research project that is due to start in uh, uh, in January. Right. At the moment, we're thinking of hiring two postdocs. But if we have a good student who's interested in big data and analytics, uh, then we can create a scholarship out of that project and maybe hire a postdoc for um, a shorter period of, of time. Right. So things are flexible. Register your interest and you know, see what potential supervisors can do in terms of creating more security and scholars. Great. Thank you very much. I hope you all